Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 33rd meeting of 2018. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present uh, to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill. This is the fifth of the committee's evidence sessions with stakeholders. And today we're holding an additional meeting to discuss innovation and what's required to meet the targets set out in the bill. I'm delighted to welcome our witnesses this morning. Joining us are, uh, in, in the committee room are John Ferguson, Eco Idea M Limited, and Susie Goodsir from Greener Kirkcaldy. We will have uh, joining us, just going to be slightly late, Dave Moxham, Deputy General Secretary of the STUC, and by video conference, by telephone, uh, we have Angus McCrone, the Chief Editor of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So good morning to you all. So we'll good start morning. our questions, and I'll, I'll ask a, an opening question, which really relates to what we think has worked so far in terms of encouraging innovation and what hasn't worked so far in Scotland. So, you know, how well have approaches to encouraging innovation for and solutions to climate change worked to date? And what measures have been taken and what's worked best? So if anybody wants to chime in, I'd have to say to Mr McCrone, if you just let us know if you want to come in. I will, yes. I, I, but uh, somebody else can start. Okay. Would anyone else like to start? John Ferguson. Thank you, uh, Lady Convener. Uh, my name is John Ferguson. Um, I think, in terms of, first of all, ans answering the question of what has worked well, I think uh, it, it, the, the clean technology and, and the low carbon technology sector, if you take Apple as a proxy of a $1 trillion company, is worth tens of trillions of dollars now. It's growing rapidly. It's exponential growth everywhere across the world. There's a well-networked um, clean technology sector globally. The UK has focused a lot of effort through knowledge transfer partnerships and Innovate UK and Scotland in programmes such as that delivered by Zero Waste Scotland on resource uh, sector innovation. So the technology innovation is there. Now, my business is fundamentally about clean technology, so I watch this as a scientist uh, on an almost daily basis. I don't think the issue is so much the, the technology, which is working. There are areas where we, we still need innovation and improvement, and that will continue. It's just a natural part of of science uh, and engineering. The bit that doesn't work is they're simply not bringing these technologies to bear into systems, and we're not creating the system transitions, um, which is about how our markets work fundamentally. So I think the technologies are there. The innovation systems to stimulate technology and innovation are there and increasingly successful. Um, we're just not adopting them, bringing them in, and transferring them to do their good work quickly enough. As, um, one of the things that I've, I've been listening to, to people around this is that Obviously, Scotland's made up with quite a lot of small to medium-sized enterprises, and they're getting on with doing their business, so they maybe don't have as much time to get involved in innovation. And maybe the links between small to medium-sized enterprises and maybe universities or innovators, maybe that link is missing. Would you agree with that? I think there are mechanisms there to encourage it. Um, you can get innovation grants, but the purpose of an innovation grant is not innovation, it's to get you used to working with the university. So yeah. if you're a small SME, and many of the SMEs are the innovation companies. My company is a tiny company, but we're innovating across a, a range of different sectors. Um, I've done an innovation grant with Dundee University, and I thought I could do five more of these with other universities, got five other ideas, but oh, I could, you can only get one of these. And that's maybe a limitation in that connection um, between small companies and, and uh, universities. Yeah, would anyone else like to, to, to answer the, the broader question that I asked? Susie Good, sir. Yes, um, so my focus is, is more on people and communities rather than technologies, um, but I think there's a lot has worked that there, and particularly in the last 10 years. Yeah. We've had the, the Climate Challenge Fund, which has funded over a thousand projects in local communities to engage people um, and community groups around innovative ways of changing behaviours and attitudes around climate change. And I think there's been some fantastic work around raising awareness and setting the groundwork for behaviour change there. There's also been support for, um, from the Local Energy Scotland, the CARE scheme for community energy projects. So there's been some fantastic <coughs> and innovative community energy projects happened, particularly in the Highlands and Islands. Um, and I think there's a real potential for more of that to happen in, in more urban communities. 
Okay. Uh, Stuart Stevenson has a, a supplementary question. I, I do, and if I may, in the first instance, I want to direct it to Angus Macron, although I may come back to people in the room. And one of the measures of uh, how one's doing on, uh, on innovation is the number of patents that there are where technology is concerned. And I understand the number of patents is actually falling at the moment. Now, I have no idea of the breakdown of patents between the wide range of things that are used in this particular area. And I just wondered uh, whether Angus Macron, um, and I'm making him represent the whole of Bloomberg, uh, has any, any views on that, and whether looking at patents is a good indicator of, uh, of, of whether innovation is or is not taking place. Um, yes, I'm not sure I'm gonna give you a very good answer on that, but um, it's, it's obviously an indicator. Um, I think um, one of the issues is that quite a few of the technologies in the low carbon tradition have actually uh, matured a lot in the last um, 10 to 15 years. So, for instance, technologies like onshore wind, um, solar photovoltaics, offshore wind, um, th those things have become pretty mature technologies with an established um, established products so the innovation that's happening is is generally by large companies and it's very much sort of incremental um, innovation rather than sort of small um, businesses in in sheds um, inventing new products so I, I think that's sort of part of the the overall picture but I was going to sort of mention some areas where I think um, Scotland could um, take advantages of its of its sort of natural resources and um, could look to sort of push through innovation and, and be a center of activity. Um, so um, it, in no particular order, um, the, the whole area of um, demand response um, is going to be huge in the balancing of the electricity system in the future. So um, there are going to be new industrial processes um, to take advantage of the peaks and troughs that there are inevitably going to be in the electricity supply. So Scotland, with its large um, uh, share of renewable generation, could be somewhere that um, some of these new processes could be uh, could be cited. Similarly, the use of batteries in, in balancing the electricity system, that's something that, um, again, uh, Scotland could sort of um, help to pioneer uh, with projects. And the pairing of batteries with other technologies like um, wind, tidal and wave, um, another, uh, another interesting area. And then small island grids, a lot of islands in Scotland, and the potential to um, pair um, technologies like wind um, with batteries and even with some diesel generation and then export that, that sort of expertise around the world. And a final thing, um, we're seeing um, uh, onshore wind projects um, beginning to happen, the very sort of very beginnings uh, of those happening without any kind of subsidy support um, in parts of Europe. And uh, there's a potential for Scotland to be somewhere where that happens, taking advantage of Scotland's um, great resources in wind, um, backed with um, corporate purchasing. So you, you could have um, big companies buying electricity from wind projects um, and um, doing those deals in, in Scotland because of the, uh, of the good economics that could be available on wind projects there. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, thank you very much. I want to, if I may, just very briefly ask John Ferguson in relation to his company's activities, if you use patents to protect your intellectual property or how do you otherwise protect your, your own innovations uh, from unhelpful exploitation by others? Um, I, would, I would protect the, the know-how just by being sensible in who I speak to about it. Um, it's often, I think, for small companies, more about how you get to market, how quickly you get to market, and just be the first mover. Because actually protecting patents on a global basis, when you're in a globalised economy and you've got China breathing down your neck and basically looking at everything you're doing, how are you going to take on a Chinese company that takes your ideas? And I think that puts a lot of people off the cost and the time involved in patenting. patenting. Unless it's, it's such a brilliant idea that you simply have no choice with your investor to have it protected from their perspective. So a lot of the time the innovation isn't actually... Um, patentable, it's about know-how, okay. um, and it's about protecting that know-how. Before we move on to the next question, I just want to ask, around, we had a debate in Parliament about research funding uh, at 
post Brexit. I mean, obviously, we talked about universities, and the universities can often be key when it comes to um, getting research funding that might drive innovation. How big a problem do we see that funding coming away from the EU in terms of driving innovation in this area? Is that something that's crossed your mind? I, I think it must have crossed everybody's mind who's involved in innovation and research. Um, and I've certainly heard lots of academics speaking about it. I would probably leave the, the words to them. I think the academics are vocal enough in standing up and saying they have concerns about the, the networks, the connections, and the flow of, of investment into research. Um, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know enough about um, how academics are, are funded through UK government to know whether the UK government can take up the slack of any uncertainty that may come post-Brexit. But uh, uncertainty is not a good thing, I have to say. Thank you. Now we move on to questions from Finlay Carson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the, the Just Transition Partnership suggested, what we're hearing just now, is that there's, there's too low, uh, low a rate of investment, particularly in clean energy systems, and, and your business has suggested that a clear route uh, map uh, and policy would help drive investment. But it's not just about tech, it's also about uh, innovation when it comes to, to people and, and, and activities. <laughs> Can you tell me, do you think there's been adequate leadership and support for new ideas to succeed? Uh, and how could we encourage uh, more innovation. I think it's really important to include communities in energy innovation. Um, communities are impacted by the en energy infrastructure. There's a lot of communities in Scotland with re re high levels of fuel poverty, um, and there's also a lot of fantastic energy resource. And to try and comp marry them up would, would be a, a great solution. I think there's there's been some some funding for community projects. A lot of it has been focused on the Highlands and Islands, just historically. So I think there's a real opportunity to do more with urban central belt communities around community renewables. Possibly more more support is needed for the CARES scheme. Possibly more support is needed for organisations like Community Energy Scotland, who work with local communities to try and ensure that they can take advantage of the the innovations that are coming to the energy system. We've got you know, smart energy systems coming. There's a lot of change on the horizon. The traditional model of a community energy project of a community having a wind turbine or a share in a wind farm, those days are have ended really. Um, so there's, I think there's a real need for communities to have a stake in the changes that are coming and in the, the new kinds of energy projects that are on the horizon to make sure that it isn't just corporate ownership and pro profits leaving our communities. And just in support of what Liz has said there, and in support of what Angus has said also, uh, is that Angus <coughs> led in some you know, areas where we could innovate. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at how we embed renewable systems into industrial contexts in as much the same way you would do into, to, into communities. And it kind of democratises, decentralises, and it gives those communities of businesses or people long-term future price security. Um, and it really makes the market start to work for people and consumers and the environment perhaps less than investors. And we need investors. I'm not saying that investment is not important. But I think how we structure the market can be orientated and biased in, in one or other directions. And I think we need to come away from very large scale centralized systems uh, to a decentralized embedded system. So if you take a wind turbine um, uh, and put that into the grid, the sleeving costs before it gets to the consumer are enormous. If you put that wind turbine into a business park and sell it direct to the consumers, it works for the wind farm and it works for the, the, the businesses that are buying that power. So those embedded systems for communities and businesses is one of the ways we need to move in the future. And I think one, one example where that's worked very well is the, the Edinburgh Solar Cooperative, where lots of members of the local community have, invest, have actually invested to enable solar panels to be put on lots of public and community buildings in Edinburgh. Very successful project. We could have much more of that. Sure. Can, can I just supplement from that? We, we've heard from other sectors, agriculture, uh, where there is technology and advice out there, but the knowledge transfer is not good. So that, in some way, actually um, reduces the impact that those new technologies could, could bring. So what, what do you see would be the thing that would make the difference to whether it's small businesses or, or communities looking to drive innovation? Is there, is there one magic bullet that would, would help that with the knowledge transfer or whatever to, to get more companies on board and communities on board? I think for our sector, the, it's good, trusted, knowledgeable intermediary organisations with funding support. Um, 
Local Energy Scotland, Community Energy Scotland, organisations like that who have the technical expertise to support community organisations who are doing these projects on the ground with capacity building and project development support. Mentioned questions on this theme from first from John Scott. Uh, thank you very much. That's a question from Mr. Ferguson, really, but I was particularly impressed with your evidence, I have to say, and your obvious desire to innovate. Um, and it stimulated my mind into thinking, you talk about community schemes, both of you, but in terms of being even more granular than that, um, it, digging it right down to self-sufficient households and the move that we're going to have towards electric vehicles. And if solar panels, uh, batteries installed in individual houses, solar panels through the day, you charge up your car from these batteries through the night, and there's a there's a virtuous circle. Is that a practical thought, or is it just me being a bit a flight of fancy? It's absolutely a practical thought, and actually, you know, Angus mentioned you know uh, demand response balancing and 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 uh, you know would add load balancing to that. That those systems of storage actually can function in that context as well. But I'll hand over to, to Liz for just a moment because she was talking about um, heat batteries, and I think that's another way because 52 or over 50 percent of our energy demand in Scotland grows is, is for heat, and um, for commercial space and for domestic spaces. So, go and tell them the story you told me. So we're seeing in um, my organisation, Greener Kirkcaldy, we run an energy advice service um, where we go out to households across Fife. Um, giving people advice on home energy use. A lot of that work is about fuel poverty, but a lot of it is also about carbon reduction and people who are interested in reducing their carbon footprint. And we found a, a, a small but growing interest in, in battery storage. People are they're interested in the idea of self-sufficiency. If they've already got solar panels or other renewables on their home, they're really interested in making the most of that energy, especially as the, the feed-in tariffs and the financial subsidies are, are decreasing. So we're finding people interested in, in heat batteries. There's a, a product called Sunamp, which is a, a Scottish company, um, relatively low cost to install. It's a fairly small piece of equipment. It can go in your attic or next to your, your boiler connects up to your home renewables, connects up to your heating system and hot water, and will pay for itself over the lifetime of the equipment, probably much less. So there's there's a real and growing interest in that kind of technology. People are up for it. I think the sort of game changer there is that quite a lot of homes might have sufficient room to store, to have a battery installed, or, you know, a, a different configurations and shapes of batteries. Um, I remember when I was a child, that the electricity didn't come from the lines. And there was a, whole, a shed that was devoted to battery storage that must have come from a generator and storing electricity then. So it's quite possible to do it on an individual household basis, but I just wonder how much thought has been given to that, the development of that as a self-sufficient households. Technology innovation curve in battery storage is, is again, it's exponential and the different ways of, of, of storing batteries. And it's all about balancing the, if you want to make a change at scale, you need to know that the natural resources are there. So a technology that uses a lot of gallium, for example, might not be viable because something isn't enough of that um, rare earth metal. So um, the technology innovation in that space is very rapid. So I would see, keep an eye on both heat batteries and uh, energy storage batteries um, as part of the solution, certainly for wind because you're getting you know, balancing of, of loads, so you're getting a, a base load system out of a wind farm that could not be base load otherwise. Okay, so we move on to a supplementary question from Claudia Beamish. Just want to say good morning to Dave Mox. Oh, <coughs> good. Oh, like Absolutely no problem at all. Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, Convener. Good morning now, I can say to you all. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, just to be inclusive of, um, of uh, Angus uh, Macron uh, as well, um, I, I would be very keen to know and, I, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking this question, it would appear from a negative position, but it's a, a reflection on the past, which I hope will lead us to a positive future. Um, some would say that um, when it comes to R&D, Scotland, fantastic. That we've already highlighted lots of uh, things that are happening now, but there is a perception sometimes that comes to me in, in my brief that... Uh, uh, we don't get to commercialisation always, and um, yeah, I, I use the example that everyone uses uh, of um, 
and I'm sorry to quote him in a way, but Professor Salter's ducks, you know, with the, with the, with the wave power. But there are lots of examples where why have we not been able to have manufacturing, for instance, of, of renewables here, which would be so important on the sort of scale that um, I frankly think is, is perfectly possible. And I wonder if there's any comments on that and, uh, from, from any of you, you know, any, any um, beyond what has already been discussed. Well, I can have a go at that, um, maybe. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think um, the issue with wave energy is not that um, Scotland's missed a manufacturing boat because the manufacturing boat hasn't left the harbour yet. That that sector really hasn't got going anything like as quickly as um, sort of anyone in, in any country hoped. Um, I think the, the kind of mistake that, Scotland made um, in retrospect was um, in uh, investing uh, public money in large amounts of public money in individual technologies. And um, as it happened, several of those technologies then went out of the companies behind them, went out of business and quite a bit of money was lost. I think some lessons have been learned from that and a different approach is now being tried via Wave Energy Scotland. And um, certainly on the tidal side, um, there's been more uh, an emphasis on um, backing some of the early projects like the Mayjan project rather than sort of putting money on particular technology. So I think that's, that's progress. In terms of whether um, Scotland bec could become a hub for mass manufacturing of some of these new technologies, um, there's, it's not just a Scottish issue, it's also a UK issue, sort of invented in the UK, uh, developed in the US, uh, made in Japan is the usual thing that we used to hear about um, when it came to uh, a lot of technologies a few decades ago. And that same principle um, is a, a danger when you, you have a situation where you get early support for a technology and then um, the government uh, then goes uh, lukewarm on it and somebody else picks up the baton and, and develops it. So I think um, consistency of, of government policy is very, very important on that. Um, but I think one of the areas um, where it's important to focus not just in, in sort of manufacturing factory jobs, but actually is sort of building up the expertise. And it's very often that sort of expertise and that service skill that um, is a lot of the value, valuable export um, opportunity. So I mentioned a few areas earlier on. Um, we um, were talking a moment ago about um, electric vehicles, and that's um, another very sort of up-and-coming area in low carbon. Our forecasts are 55% of, of um, car, car sales globally in, in 2040 will be electric vehicles. So it's going to totally transform the transport sector. And there's a very interesting um, interplay between um, electric vehicles and the grid via what we call dynamic charging, which is the ability to charge your electric vehicle when the electricity price is low. Um, rather than when it's high, and um, that that requires um, public acceptance for um, the use of um, smart uh, meter and um, uh, other sort of information on electricity prices um, coming into the home. So there's a lot the government can do in um, encouraging that take up and early early success in de developing that kind of dynamic charging. Will I think. Um, provide some uh, some skills that then can be exported to other countries. Dave Moxon wanted to come in. Yeah, a couple of the points that were made there I was going to make, although probably um, with a little less expertise um, than my colleague there. Um, there have been failures in the past. Um, I think it would be a mistake, number one, to do that. We've had our fingers burnt before. We'll try again. There is an element of risk-taking here, but it's necessary risk-taking because of the um, because of the because of the stakes, um, the experience. As I say, I come from the position of both, both of the SGC, but more specifically uh, the Just Transition uh, Commission. The negative experiences that people um, have had um, in the past in terms of, of transition is really really important to get right now um, and and begin to reverse. And um, we need to find a way, a better way of connecting some of the R&D that um, I think we all agree that we have to, um, we have to undertake um, with, the, um, with the transport to market. And for us, there's a key role um, for government um, in that. 
Um, and, and a couple of the examples given there were, um, were absolutely ideal from our point of view. We do see the potential for some um, really um, uh, good work to be done, particularly um, through the establishment of the Just Transition Commission with as much power as possible and as much direction or power as possible um, to really um, uh, ensure that when that R&D um, uh, is in, when we begin to see that innovation, um, it's properly um, uh, built into um, an industrial strategy. And if there are gaps between um, the technology and the delivery, to ensure that we have a plan, even if it involves government investment, to deliver that. So filling that gap, we feel, uh, is a real um, role for a Just Transition Commission advising, advising the government. Mark Roskell. Um, can I just ask briefly about the, the Climate Challenge Fund? Because um, it, it's been you know, phenomenal success over a thousand projects. I was involved in some of the early discussions around the establishment of the fund, and we always sort of saw it as a kind of community laboratory of innovation and ideas. But it does pose a question about how we mainstream some of these approaches. So there's some fantastic work going on in individual communities, and that's having some reach. But are there particular lessons from CCF projects that now should be taken forward as mainstream approaches, and how do we, how do we actually do that? Because I guess there's danger within the voluntary sector you're continually trying to innovate to get the next batch of funds. And that that's that's a that is a real a real risk. I think with the the climate challenge fund supported over a thousand projects, as you say, for of I think a hundred million pounds over the last ten years. One of the challenges with it is it it looks for constant innovation, and there the funding tends to be relatively short term. Often it's it's only for one year. It does take longer than that to embed projects in communities, um, and I think a, a key priority for certainly from the community's point of view for any future developments of that fund would be for funding to be available over periods of at least three years to really identify learning and, and embed the changes that, that they're making. I think the key successes that the, the Climate Challenge Fund has had, I mean, it, it's made measurable impacts on carbon, but I think more importantly, it's learned us a lot about activating behaviour changes opening up possibilities for people that they hadn't maybe considered before, things like battery storage, electric vehicles. There's been a lot of really good work done there, um, helping people to overcome barriers. And there, there has been a lot of learning about what the barriers are to uptake of um, green technologies in people's homes and lifestyles. Um, there's probably scope for a review of the fund at this, at this stage. I know there have been reviews done in the past um, to pull together some of that learning and talk about what, where it could be mainstreamed. The, the Scottish Government do have behaviour change programmes, but a lot of it is around communications and effectively marketing campaigns, um, and then delivery through organisations like the Energy Saving Trust, rather than mainstreaming it through grassroots, bottom-up community type work. Mm -hmm. okay. And Mark Russell would like to move on to his team of questions of the, the targets. Go to a, a slightly bigger global question, and, and, and that's around the targets, which is obviously a critical decision and, and question um, that's before us within this bill. Um, so, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about you know business and, and businesses' role in potentially meeting a 90% target, um, but perhaps each of you could just explain how you think business and innovation would react if there was a, a higher target, a net zero target. A carbon target, net, net zero greenhouse gas emissions target by 2050 or 2040. What signal does that send to markets? Um, how does that um, become a driver for innovation? Turn Mark, to my previous point that it's perhaps not the innovation market that's, that's needing that stimulus, it's the organisational system issue of um, national governments, local governments, installing the new ideas, the new op options for these technologies to do the work that they can do. Um, I, I do worry that we are constantly trying to um, run after a moving ball, and every time we get there, it's 50 yards ahead of us. So whenever we think we're doing something, we're just the, the, the issue is moving very rapidly and too quickly for us. Uh, and that's why we submitted a paper on, on how we develop rapid transitions by changing how we do things, perhaps through joint councils in regional areas, by having special powers, by bringing in the agencies, Scottish Enterprise, and making them work together under a specific mandatory framework to say, you know, for example, I gave you the example in the paper of Tayside with the Western Edge project 
um, the potential to put fossil fuel energy district concepts, new smart grids in there, the bin uh, groups, projects on, on plastics changing um, completely how we address plastics recycling. These can be catalysts, they're real commercial projects, but if we pick them up and spread them across regions quickly because we have the mechanisms in place to do this, then that technological innovation will get applied quickly. So for me, it's about finding ways of applying the technological innovation that is there. It's, it will keep changing. And you know, Angus mentioned, for example, the offshore marine renewables. There's an area where we keep continually needing to innovate till we see things that work. Um, and then we need to get them working and transiting at scale. We're just not good enough in terms of strategy to make that transition happen. We've got to find new ways of speeding it up. Just very briefly on that, it's, it's, um, and I do agree, it's show, it show not tell um, in some sort of ways. And the, um, um, the high targets, um, I think, are positive. Um, and I think they probably have a positive effect on the R&D environment in the sense that um, you get a, you know, a, a positive response. It's been shown globally that you get a positive response to the setting of high targets. What that doesn't necessarily do is A, um, do the show not tell, or B, guarantee that the benefits of that, which we need to be felt economically, industrially, in terms of jobs and communities, necessarily reside in Scotland. Um, and in order to win that other big battle, which is the change of behaviours, we need to do that. So it really is the, it really is the kind of nuts and bolts delivery, um, getting ahead of the ball, but getting ahead of the ball in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the quick expansion of things that work um, into, in, into high volume uh, that will make those um, uh, higher targets something that um, I think people can relate to, both the people we represent and communities more generally. Oh. Uh, from a point of view of communities and, in, and individuals, a target of zero sets a very strong signal. It, it's sh it would show the government leading from the front and it sends a very strong message and will, I think, catalyse a lot of change. Would Angus Macron like to respond? Well, I was just going to say that, um, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm, uh, sort of admire the setting of... Um, tough targets, um, for sure, it does give a, a sense of direction, uh, which is very important. I think sort of looking at it um, in terms of the different pieces, uh, you can say that um, the electricity sector, it, it's fairly clear how um, targets um, can translate into change in the electricity sector. It's already well in progress there. Um, the UK, for instance, has been um, a good performer in terms of reducing emissions from electricity generation, and you can see that um, continuing. The technologies are there. The choices are, are more about how quickly they're implemented and what what more can be done to encourage it. Similarly, on the transport side, although it's sort of come about a bit later and um, progress is, uh, has been slower up to now, um, there's pretty pretty clear path ahead with electrification and um, certainly by the mid-2020s the, the economics will be switching fairly decisively in favour of, of electric cars. So you can see how um, targets can be achieved in, in so far as they relate to the transport sector. But the big issue is heat and you can have a very aggressive target um, that's great but um, it's uh, you've also got to sort of bear in mind that the path uh, by which we might get to that target in the heat sector is nothing like as clear as it is in electricity and transport and there are technologies but it's not clear which of those technologies are really going to make a difference and it's obviously a massive issue in in Scotland with its with its um, history of um, uh, housing and um, challenges of keeping people warm and so on. Um, so that's what I say about the target. Good to have the target, but um, uh, a lot more work needs to be done on what the pathway is on, on the heat side. Uh, Stuart Stevenson has a supplementary question on that theme. Um, and maybe I'll start with Angus Macron. It's a very simple question. Who should, set, who should determine what the targets are, scientists or politicians? Well, I think it has to be a combination of, of, of the two. I and mean, politicians, um, in the end, should set them because it's part of the democratic process and they need to be answerable for um, how they go about setting policies to meet the targets. But mm -hmm. clearly it has to be strongly based on the scientific evidence. Long-term targets are difficult because we don't know how technologies are going to 
to evolve over that time. So um, there must be some flexibility to to make targets more aggressive or, or less aggressive, depending on how um, the technologies evolve. But it's important to, as a statement, to have those strong targets um, so people know what the direction of, of policy is. Other members of the panel? Policy is, 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 is evidence-based, and scientists are fundamentally important to do that. But you also have to take business and communities with you. So it's not just politicians and, and scientists. It's, it's the global society has to resolve this issue, and each have a role to play in that. Dave Markson? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, hopefully I'm not taking this too wide or too global, but there's an enormous polarisation happening, happening in world politics now in the US, in Europe, and in other places, uh, where politicians... Um, not in this place, as far as I can see, certainly not, not on this issue, but politicians are responding to um, what they perceive to be, and in some time, uh, sometimes actually generate, are the concerns of the dispossessed working class, the concerns of people who don't feel that they've been part of or, or, or included in uh, the six significant economic and industrial changes we've seen. Um, so I trust politicians, um, but the politicians that I trust are the ones who will also pay attention to how those arguments are won at community, obviously, I would say, at trade union level too, because without that buy-in, we undoubtedly risk, in every country in the world, that kind of um, uh, polarisation, one might call it the collapse of the centre, um, which um, I think is of particular danger in respect to, um, uh, to, to what I hope are our shared aims on, um, uh, on, on climate change and carbon reduction. Uh, Mark Ruskell wanted to come back in. Um, yeah, I mean, just, just coming back to targets again, I mean, uh, you know, there obviously isn't a clear pathway at the moment in Scotland's climate plan to get to a net zero target. Um, are there examples from your experience of um, other targets or aspirations of government where there's been uncertainty and yet business has lent into that, innovated, working with or without communities in some cases um, to, to establish a pathway and achieve a target? Mark, sorry, I didn't quite pick up the question. Uh, I'm thinking about, the, we've got a question around a clear pathway to net zero. Um, and my question is around, have there been other targets, aspirations that governments have had in the past where there hasn't been clarity at the outset of the pathway towards the objective, but business has had a role in innovation, bringing forward innovation over a time period to actually address that? I have an ex example which isn't really from the past, it's, for, it's from the future. There's a piece of legislation going through at the moment also around fuel poverty, um, which is going to set an aspiration either for fuel poverty to go to 5% or potentially high, um, lower by 2040, linking to this issue around decarbonisation of heat. So I think there's some great, so there's going to be some very good synergies in, in terms of both, both of those targets. I'm not sure there's a, a clear plan of how to get to fuel poverty of 5% by 2040. It, there's going to be a lot of innovation required there too, and hopefully that will um, be a win-win with the climate change targets. An obvious example is, you know, the aspirations of the US government to put a person on the moon for the first time. You know, there wasn't a clear pathway to achieving that, but what, what kind of collaborations between academia, business, what, what kind of works in terms of addressing a gap, filling it, innovating around those sectors? Maybe Angus has got thoughts there around energy as well. Sorry, do you mind saying that again? I just missed the end of the sentence. Okay, I'll try it again. Um, in terms of uh, how industry manages to innovate, um, so meeting a, meeting a target, you know, I mentioned the example of government sets an aspiration, we're going to put somebody on the moon, mm. then industry, academia, governments need to work together in order to uh, understand the uncertainty, innovate around it, and actually achieve a target. M my point for you, Angus, was around energy, um, whether you saw any examples within energy where there wasn't a clear pathway to achieving a particular goal around energy, and yet industry managed to innovate around that. Not in, I mean, not in quite the clear way that you've um, said with the Moon program. I suppose in that particular case, um, you know, the U.S. government was throwing vast amounts of money at the, at the problem, so that, that always helps. Um, but 
uh, you know, obviously the UK has, has met its um, CO2 reduction targets from the 1990 benchmark, more than met them. Um, and uh, similarly, it's going to either meet or become incredibly close to meeting the uh, 2020 renewable energy targets. So targets can be hit and the private sector does it always um, proves to be very um, versatile and adaptive to to think of uh, ways of meeting them as long as the incentives are there and the, the price signals to make it happen. Um, so that's obviously crucial. Um, as I say, the, I think the issue with a sort of long-term, very, very ambitious um, CO2 reduction target we're talking about here is what happens on the on the heat side. Until there's a little bit more clarity on what technologies are going to win through there, um, it's difficult to be certain about how that can be brought about from the government side. Um, to give a specific example, Mark, um, I'll use the zero waste environment. Um, going back to actually before zero waste became a popular concept, it became very clear we had to deal with landfill. 1996 were on the landfill tax. And what that did was it internalised the, the, the external costs placed on the environment by landfilling. And when I started in this business, it was 97% of our waste to landfill. So it was a significant impact in terms of methanogenic potential to drive climate change. So we banned landfill. Um, and that changed how the industry structured its innovation, its investments and its, its, its um, assets. Um, and that drove innovation towards reuse, towards recycling, towards finding cleaner ways of making energy from, from the waste that we can do nothing else with. So that was one way of saying, if you can't do this anymore. So if you did a say, uh, for example, in the energy sector, if you said, look, within a few years, you will not be able to use diesel generated power systems. You'll have to have something alternative in place. That would drive a massive displacement. One of the businesses I work for generates almost all of its energy from diesel generation. And it's trying to be a low carbon business. How can it do that? Right, so we're trying to put alternative renewable systems in place. So you might say you can create that transition and that innovation by saying, well, you know, there's a really bad thing. We're going to stop that, but we're going to stop it in a transitory period where you've got time to adjust and deal with it. But at some point, you can't do that anymore. So that's one way that you can make that transition happen, I think. But there wasn't clarity at the beginning of that process when that landfill ban well, target was nobody, set about how to get Nobody knew there. absolutely how right. that was going to pan out, but it set the environment of change. There will be... Um, a cost for landfill, and as that cost rose, the response rose, um, uh, you know, in, in proportion to it, at, to the point where we're now in a position to say, and by 2021, we're pretty much banning this to landfill completely. So you move from one mechanism into another mechanism. Yeah. Are there other other examples? No, just, just a general comment because I um, I agree. There's certainly no dissent from us that this setting of targets can provoke positive innovation and positive reaction, even if you don't know exactly what the path um, might be. Um, there's risks if it becomes profitable not to innovate, but to find other offshoring or um, you know, importing alternatives. So we have to be clear that by setting the target, we're also giving some sort of guidance about what constitutes a positive economic social benefit um, and, and, and what might be the opposite. So I'd be, I'd be slightly careful of saying that a top-down mechanism um, in using the market to encourage people to decide can, can automatically do that. It undoubtedly can in some circumstances. Again, don't want to be a broken record, but returning to um, an enterprise um, environment and a connected strategy, including the Scottish National Investment Bank and others, that promotes um, it promotes the best possible responses to that, which are socially inclusive, I think is very important too. Two questions from John Scott. Thank you. And just um, dealing with the sort of micro ideas that you've been dealing with, uh, just going towards the practical, is, is, is large-scale systemic uh, change now required to ensure decarbonation? decarbonisation and how can structural change be facilitated, facilitated and financed? Do um, you want to talk about, about that from your perspectives, your different perspectives? Certainly from our point of view, um, a couple of points there. Um, certainly all uh, available investment mechanisms, including the um, National Investment Bank, are going to be absolutely vital here. Um, no apology here by saying increased um, government investment is absolutely vital. We've certainly seen increased investment in R&D. We certainly wouldn't criticise what's been undertaken um, thus far. But if we are looking at the type of systemic change, whether we're talking about major systems 
or whether we're talking about, frankly, the redesign or partial redesign of a whole economy, um, then you are undoubtedly talking about um, um, a significant need for additional state investment. Now, I realise that in this place, we're already talking about a competency that um, is, is, is partly UK and partly Scottish, but, you know, I make no apology for saying that we need to we need to jump now for CCS and we need to, to, to have the investment um, in, in place in order to do that. The same with um, uh, uh, electrification. Um, you know, these are things that w we need to do now um, and we can't just rely on the private sector and investment landscape to deliver. Other views on that? Just think, thinking on a very micro scale about individual households, we're, we're talking about asking people to make significant changes to their existing homes in many cases, particularly older properties. So we need continued investment in grants and loans from, um, which are currently administered, administered from the Energy Saving Trust, Home Energy Scotland. Um, those are popular and successful and that needs to increase and, and continue. Mr. Ferguson? I would say perhaps, the, you know, looking at how we use the, <coughs> the combined systems of planning, fiscal taxation um, and statutory regulation to create, you know, uh, for example, transition levies in some cases where you put something uh, on the cost of something, a small marginal cost over a period of time to fund that change or um, a subsidy. So if you change, you'll get this subsidy to, to help you make that change. For example, there would be fiscal instruments that could come in. Um, we have to get our planning system fit for purpose. I genuinely think it isn't. Um, I don't mean to offend anybody involved in planning, but uh, I've used the planning system for many, many years. And I just think it's just it's part of the problem. It's far too slow. It doesn't set the strategic framework correctly. The national planning framework is a great idea, but it's underachieving. Um, and I think we have to start with planning because that is the framework within which everybody has to work to do anything that means infrastructure on the ground. You won't change systems without changing infrastructure. Mr. McCrone, do you want to say anything or not? Um, yes, maybe. Um, so the building side is obviously absolutely crucial to this. Um, so I think a couple of questions would be, um, you know, are we doing enough via new building regulations and also regulations for conversion of properties? Are we doing enough to uh, enforce um, very, very strong energy efficiency requirements? Um, you know, is there enough being done when it comes to replacing buildings? If we have buildings that have really reached the end of their life or beyond, um, that um, there's enough incentive for the owners of those buildings, whether they're um, uh, landowners or individuals or councils, to actually um, go about re uh, replacing them with um, something much more energy efficient. So I don't know the I don't know the answer to those questions, but those would be some areas to look at. Excellent. Uh, so, would you therefore, all of you, regard this need as uh, opportunities, uh, business economic opportunities, um, to be to be grasped, as it were, from mit mitigation and adaptation to climate change? Um, what do we need to do to maximise that? I mean, one of the things that struck me uh, that comes across here is that is essentially the supply chain of of going from ideas. Uh, to enterprise companies, um, to government approval, to and uh, that and a, and a big gap in all of that is the education of, of of people like ourselves, because this whole process for us has been a learning curve about the potentials that exist out there, um, and also I think probably for government and civil servants too. But um, there seems to be a, 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 the innovations out there, the science is out there, but getting it. To the next stage, Mr. Ferguson has already spoken about that. I think there's a real problem there through, I don't know whether it's through Scottish Enterprise or HIE or what, but would you like to develop that theme a little more and identify the problems and, and tell us where the sore bits are and how you think they might be sorted? If you easily can. Pardon? Um, the, I think one of the issues is, is the time scales required. I mean, I'm saying you need to make rapid transitions, but when you're looking at developments, there might be a rapid transition, might be a five or 10 year period. Um, at the rate we're going, we might never do it. Um, we're not good at doing the infrastructure. Waste is a good example. We've got a tremendously good waste, uh, zero waste strategy, but no infrastructure to deliver landfill bans, et cetera, because we've not focused on some of the unpopular issues that, that are in that bag of, of issues. So um, I think we need 
to understand that the time scales required don't necessarily fit the political paradigm of short-term governments in power for four years, changing the, the guard. So you're clear you're doing this for four years, and then, oh, it's changed, and we're going over here. We need a little bit of um, time planning between political parties on a cross-party basis, that certain things are sacrosanct. We need to do this. We all agree we need to do this. Let's put it into a safe environment. That's your framework for 15 years. That would create stability for investment, uh, stability for planning, and stability for business. And it would allow time for adjustment in terms of the, the, the public engagement, the messaging, and the, and the culture change that needs to go on. So I think um, going cross-party, <clears throat> medium to long-term planning, uh, getting consensus across some of these issues and stop them being political footballs. Um, there's enough politics in politics you know, for all of us, and I think that that's fine, that certain things are of mutual benefit to all people. And I think we have to try and find that consensus um, between all parties on certain things and just say, that's it, we'll nail that down, we're not going to mess with that. That's the framework, get on and do that. And then within that framework, we could perhaps accelerate transition. Makes sense, self-evidently, if we're going for targets for 2030, 2040, 2050, that we have an agreed position also across parties, could that be achieved? I don't know. But that's, that's, that's at a least some, politicians. <laughs> about some broad themes and some broad principles that could be agreed. That, that has to go hand in hand with setting the targets is the point you're making. I think that's a very val yeah. valuable point. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut across what other people are going to say. If, if, if um, anyone wants to join in this but otherwise, I'll pass to Claudia Beamy. She's got a supplementary question around this. Uh, yeah, it, it was actually a, a specific question for Angus about the target. So, shall we just wait and see if we've got time uh, at the end? A short question. Right. OK, thank you. <laughs> I'll just find it again then. Um, yeah, uh, I, I just wanted to pick up, um, uh, Angus, with yourself, if I may, and be devil's advocate for, for a minute on the targets. I think if I heard you correctly, you actually said um, that there should be the, the space or the ability to alter the targets depending on how the technology evolves. And uh, could it also perhaps be that um, there should be political leadership, and I take the point made by um, John Ferguson, across parties um, to drive the innovation and confidence in all sectors? And would this not guide new technology, bearing in mind that we do have successive climate change plans to actually set the, the, the policy frameworks into the future? Yes, um, that, that's, that's all reasonable. I think, I think the, the issue that was causing me um, maybe to give more of a nuanced answer was um, the issue of uh, heat and what the winning technologies okay, are going to be in that sort of particular segment. And that's not just an issue for Scotland, that's an issue for um, basically all northern um, countries. The, 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 the technologies are going to win through there and at what speed they're going to emerge. Um, it's not clear, so it, it's, it's very hard to to be sure about um, whether targets that are set now will be overachieved or underachieved. What we have learned up to now is um, with the uh, European 2020 targets was that uh, very rapid progress was made on the electricity side and much less on transport or heat. The transport side is becoming a lot clearer now um, subsequently, but there's still a, a lot of question marks on heat. And yes, a lot of um, political um, oomph can be created um, by the right uh, noises being made, but nevertheless, there need to be um, commercial technologies within sight to, to, to bring that about, and, and it's not yet clear what those will be. Thank you. We had questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. So, following on from, from John Scott's theme and, and the, the general uh, discussion this morning, um, we know that uh, the transformational change that we need to see is a, a, a tall order. So, um, t to achieve transformational change, do you think governments should regulate lifestyles uh, and reduce consumer choices? Uh, or do you think markets will adequately innovate to allow for continued growth? To that. <laughs> you know, John Ferguson. I, I, forgive me for speaking too much, perhaps. I think there are times when you simply have to say, this is just not working, you have to stop doing this. 
Um, markets will operate wherever they can make money. And if you take plastics, for example, we put 300 million tonnes of new plastics into the environment every year, and we're recycling 12% of that. So there's 88% of that plastics on an annual basis. It's going into landfills, it's going into incinerators, it's going into the oceans. And part of that problem is we allow the manufacture and the sale of, of complete utter nonsense. Um, and that utter nonsense moved using carbon all over the world. You know, so why are we such a consumer-based society? And why are we not focusing more on the global equity issues of everybody has enough food, clean water, security, good quality air, and such like? If we invested in those things globally, there'd be a very vibrant global economy. But we wouldn't be wasting time, resources, and, and damaging the planet doing unnecessary things. So sometimes I think it's good to say no, that we're just going to stop doing that. Um, but I'm not particularly persuaded that that's a good way of necessarily regulating society. You have to let people have a degree of freedom. So somewhere I'm in the middle of that one. I think there's a case to do it sometimes, and there's a case to let markets determine. But markets working in sensible places should be determining sensible approaches and not left entirely on to their own ends. Okay. Mark some. Sorry, I'm kind of in the middle too. There's, um, there's clearly a case for um, some regulation of consumer choice, um, but we also know, as I've said before, that people buying um, is really, really um, important to this whole process. And we have to be very careful in the regulation of consumer choice that we're being equitable in terms of people's um, choices and experiences. I think that it's, it's dangerous um, to, um, to, to limit the choices of people who already have very limited choices, um, whereas others who can do that uh, more freely um, are therefore um, uh, um, uh, able to do that, but really not without the same impact on their lifestyle. So uh, consumer choice, um, regulate it, yes, but be very careful who it's impacting and how. I mean, I just think there's a general case here um, for um, auditing uh, the impact as we go along of a lot of the decisions that we made. We need to be auditing the jobs impact. We need to be auditing the consumer impact. We need to be um, uh, auditing the, uh, the the community impact. So we need to process as we go along with these things uh, to you know to, to make judgments and to make regular judgments on what it means for people. Because if we don't do that, then we leave them behind, and I think that that's a real risk. Can I one of your previous session, evidence sessions talked specifically about behaviour change. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but there, the Scottish Government use a model called ISM, which is around how, how behaviour change happens. And it really is, talks about three levels. The individual, talking about attitudes and behaviours. Social, which is where a lot of community work comes in, setting norms, encouraging people to engage with their peers to make change. And then the third level is material, which is about regulation and um, incentives. So, and I think for behaviour change to happen on the scale that we're talking about, we need all three of these levels to come into play and, and to be done in a coherent way. Okay. Right, we're going to move on to questions around uh, the effect on people and areas of Scotland from Rhoda Grant. Previously, we um, had evidence on transport and recognised that some of the incentives to get people out of the car had an impact on rural areas. We've heard this morning about fuel poverty and how that impacts on urban inner city areas as well. So how can we make sure that this change is fair to all socio-economic groups as well as um, geographical sectors? Because it seems to me that those that have been left behind in the past will be left behind again. And we see in kind of more affluent urban areas, every roof has, you know, their, their, their photovoltaics and they can afford to invest in all of this. So it's the people that have the knowledge and have the finance that seem to be able to make that transition, leaving others behind. I think that's a, a really important point. It's, I'm particularly concerned about fuel poverty and, and how that relates to, to climate change. There are great Scottish Government schemes. We have the Warmer Home Scotland scheme, which is making um, huge improvements to homes for vulnerable households. A lot of that work is done in rural areas. But we, we could be doing more. There's a, there's, there are people who fall between the gaps. I, I think there, we have the more affluent people who can afford to make the changes to their own homes. We have people fulfilling specific criteria like passport benefits to in, um, be eligible for the Warmer Home Scotland scheme. There's a whole swathe of people in the middle who would be classified by the Energy Saving Trust as able to pay, 
but they're not really, they don't have the money for those kind of changes. So I think we need to see more, more grants, more incentives, boiler scrappage schemes, things like that, to help people make the changes to, to benefit from um, the, the drivers that are in place, or especially around home energy and heat. And of course, not everyone's a homeowner as well. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, there's areas for people are renting. And they, don't, they can't really apply for that sort of thing. Can I have a response to that? I was just going to add to that point, not that I disagree with anything that was, that was said, but um, we need to share the heat benefits um, um, as widely as possible. Um, and that certainly applies, probably even more applies to people in, um, uh, in non-owned accommodation um, than anywhere else. Uh, transport, we need to show to rural communities in particular that um, there can be positive benefits an integrated transport network, a better integrated transport network, more investment in that, in our view, um, extension to public ownership uh, in that area, because I think, um, as well as being absolutely vital in terms of um, car emissions, it's really important to show um, that benefit. Um, and in agriculture, really, as well, where we know we're not making um, enormous gains and um, any pot potential measures in agricultural could disproportionately um, affect um, uh, rural communities uh, to pick up on, in particular, on the job creating opportunities, the, the reforestation, the peat, the other thing, the things that make a, a positive impact, but can also bring uh, jobs and uh, uh, and growth to those to those areas. How do we proactively get that across, though? Because if you think, you know, people, especially urban inner cities, they you know, they're struggling to keep the roof over their head, far less going away and looking at who's going to give me this grant, who's going to give me this advice. You know, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. It's not something where you sit back and kind of do some horizon scanning and think, where do I want to be? How, in a way, we have to be much more proactive? And in our, in our work, we engage, our, our energy advice service engages around 2,000 households per year and we go out and find people. We go to mother and toddlers groups, pensioners, lunch clubs, any organisation that will accept us, any, anywhere where people are, we will go and talk to them about home energy use. We'll talk to them about things they can do themselves. We have a, a, a handy service which does simple measures for people. We'll change light bulbs for older people to low energy LEDs um, for people that might not be able to do that themselves and we'll put people in touch with grants and schemes to get significant works done to their home to make it more energy efficient. We'll also talk to them about behaviour change and simple things they can do themselves to save energy. And we'll talk to them about what's coming, what's on the horizon and reasons why they might want to make these changes now to save themselves quite a lot of money in, in the longer term. There's win-wins with, with the work that that service does. We can put people in touch with other support services, often, um, things like befriending services to tackle social isolation. We can put people in touch with citizens' advice to get benefit checks. So it's it's quite a holistic approach, but we, we go out and proactively find the people who, who need that, that service. And I think, I think going forward, there's thousands and thousands of people in Scotland in fuel poverty, and a lot of them are not coming forward for help. A lot of people are, are suffering in silence and not asking for help. So we need significant boots on the ground in communities, workers and volunteers, to actively go out and find these people. OK. I know Rudy Grant has got the questions on the workforce, but before I come to that, can we bring in John Scott on this theme? Thank you, convener. And I just applaud what you're saying, um, Susie. Good, sir. Um, I'm just developing that theme, and, and, and Dave Moxham spoke yes about incentivising, as we spoke on Tuesday, about incentivising farmers to do the right thing in the agriculture sector. And in the home sector, in the energy sector, in the heat sector, should we also be looking at incentivising people still more than we currently do? I mean, we already um, suggested that people would benefit from a rates reduction if they um, did the right thing within their homes, and I don't think there's been a huge uptake in that programme. But if we were to further proactively market that idea about doing good, sensible things to improve the quality of homes and, and heat, improving heat loss, 
then um, perhaps something could be worked out. If you've got a three-year rate window or a five-year rate window, then the scheme would pay for itself. But you, you spoke about the need to embed uh, the cost of embedding change within communities, and you spoke about that being a three-year project. So I just think, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I think making energy efficiency improvements to an existing home, people have got to be motivated to do that. It's a lot of upheaval. Um, to get a new boiler, to get in insulation in, especially when we're talking about wall insulation or underfloor insulation. It's, it's a hassle for the householder, so there needs to be an incentive to do it. There's an element of education about measures which might actually pay for themselves, but then there are also measures where I think a, a financial incentive, a stronger financial incentive is, is definitely needed. The current, currently there are energy saving trusts have an interest free loan scheme, which I believe is supported by the Scottish Government. And there are, there's a very small cashback grant component of that, but it's small. It's not. I don't think it's a, a strong enough incentive for people in existing homes. Thank you. Um, okay. Come back to Rudder Grant's questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, just turning to kind of the economy and how we change, and John Ferguson had talked about changing from a consumer-based society. So we need to shift the economic um, a focus of our society, but how do we make sure that we do that without um, a cliff edge for workers? Do we have the right skills? Do we have the right knowledge in the workforce for that transition to be seamless? Um, how do we avoid, I suppose, some of that post-industrial um, societal change that we've seen in the past going forward to change the focus of um, society? One of, the, one of the issues, uh, I'm not a specialist and an expert on this by any means, but one of the issues is we have to see that question as a global issue. And going back to the earlier question of why don't we manufacture things in this country, here's James Dyson, one of the UK's greatest innovators. Pro-Brexit, his next factory will be in Singapore. We're probably all wearing clothes made in Indonesia, and we probably many of us saw the very good programme on textiles and the impacts on textiles. So, we're allowing our products to be manufactured in countries. I'm not saying Singapore necessarily in this instance, but certainly in the cases of the textiles in Indonesia, most certainly, the environmental impacts are dumped straight down the, the pipe into the water that, funnily enough, the local communities also use and then out to the ocean. Plastics and everything. We have to stop that. We have to stop allowing our consumer supply chains to be giving us products that are actually exploiting the environment. And if we deal with that as a global issue, then we create that equity globally because the impacts on the environment in Indonesia, in the specific case of textiles, uh, are on many of the poorest people in that country. Um, but it harms our global environment, so we all suffer from that. So there's got to be a, 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 an expectation that we ask that question about how do we protect everybody's interests. But how do you do, do that without, I mean, you're talking about some of the poor, poorest people in the world, so you don't want to take the jobs away from them. How do you make that step change when we're kind of ahead to, to a larger extent, and that's why our costs are higher, that they're desperate for that kind of work and they don't have the money to invest in cleaning up, I guess, um, the output of those industries, which makes them cheaper. So how do you get people to pay more to make sure that that we're all in the same place. The fundamental issue there is fair trade. You know, so you know, if if if, if they are, they, and they have every right to make uh, goods and services and send them around the world, but they have to do it and do that to a standard. We have to set that standard. We have to be prepared to pay that standard. And I think that's the issue. We're consuming um, too much because it's too cheap. Because actually, the cost is hidden on the environment globally. And that doesn't I, help. That doesn't I help workers in, anywhere. Could I come in with a very specific and and quite. I suppose personal to, to my area, um, I'm, I come from Aberdeenshire, so I guess one of the big elephants in the room for me is the fact that in my area a lot of people's jobs are dependent on oil and gas. So if we're going to be moving to um, you know, our, our targets, there is a fear that a lot of people will, 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 will lose their, their incomes and, and there could be, as Rhoda Grant's described, it could be, as we've seen in the past, a lot of people falling off this cliff edge if we don't do things in place to make a just transition and to provide jobs. Can, can I ask Dave Moxon specifically on, on that? I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, thousands of people yes, in a particular area of Scotland. Yeah. Yes, and there's a tendency to look at that in just in straight quantum terms rather than to look at it in quality of jobs, and in particular those kind of middle-income jobs that, that 
are not particularly pre prevalent in in, uh, in in the UK economy just now and, and, and need to be held. So, um, as, as I'm sure you'll know, many, many people who previously were, worked offshore working as as labourers. Now, there's nothing wrong with labouring work, but it's not particularly good for an economy that somebody who was on £40 an hour is then working um, for £10 an hour. So it's it's a question of, of, of quality of job. And that is difficult. It's very, very difficult for our members. It's very difficult uh, for the unions uh, that represent them. Um, what we do need to see, um, um, again, you know, returning to um, uh, our hopes for the Just Transition Commission, is real forward-looking um, analysis of where the hotspots lie, where the hotspots lie in the supply chain, where the opportunities um, exist. We need to look at maximising um, in areas um, such as decommissioning, where we believe there's um, uh, work still to be done. We need to be engaging with companies who, um, such as BIFAB, or what we hope um, will be um, an operational BIFAB uh, sometime in the next um, few months, um, to look at which parts of their potential operation. We need to sell their services abroad, but we want to be selling the services abroad, um, which are the ones which are also most um, carbon um, uh, most carbon helpful rather than um, uh, most negative. So there is a real job there to do. There's a real threat. Um, uh, um, but I do think that with a, um, uh, a joined-up industrial strategy, which is informed by you know, serious analysis, forward-looking analysis of where um, the job f jobs flows will be, that it's actually uh, possible um, to meet this. Now, um, many of the people that we represent working in, in gas and, uh, and other areas aren't necessarily looking um, at you know, Im immediate job loss. I think it's fairly uncontroversial that um, you know, gas is going to... Uh, is going to continue but I mean we should already be looking um, and questioning because it's not uncontroversial we should already be looking um, at things like hydrogen uh, we should be looking at what the training and the skills needs will be um, in order to, to deal with that um, and frankly um, there will not not be any pain here um, but um, uh, there are definitely um, prophylactic things we can do and there's definitely investment-led things we can do to mitigate the impact on the, on the workers that we represent. Are schools and colleges, universities looking at that? Are we, are we bringing up a generation of people that will be ready for that kind of change and innovation? And I suppose are employers also looking at their workforce because we've got, you know, a, people that are going to work a lot longer. We've got you know, we're lucky we're all living a lot longer and you can see the pension age club. People moving through that workforce, are they being retrained? Are they aware of the changes that are going to happen and what can we do to make them oh, adaptable? Um I've seen some good examples. I couldn't, I, I couldn't honestly, um, with any authority, tell you systematically um, whether that's um, whether that's happening. I've seen some good examples. Returning to Fife, I've seen what Fife College um, is offering with respect to um, a potential apprenticeship and other training, as it would relate to what we hope would be a, a rise in decommissioning and re renewable uh, production in that factory. So I've seen it happen. Whether that's systematic or not, um, I think. Um, you probably need to ask somebody else, but identifying it as an issue and an issue that we undoubtedly could do better on however well we're doing now, I think is absolutely vital. And it's also absolutely vital in terms of the kind of community messaging and the community development that I'm sure that, that, that Susie would be interested in too. Thank you. We're going to move on to the questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Camille. Now, we've, in the discussion, we've covered a fair bit uh, about uh, getting buy-in. Uh, both from um, individuals, but perhaps less on sectors. Um, and I, I've, I've sort of jotted down a wee list of counter things that make it difficult. And I would like some comments on that, but also some suggestions. And I might just start with uh, Susie Goodser, because specifically early made reference uh, about uh, driving acceptance. Now, just a few things, and John Scott mentioned uh, uh, rateable the rating system. Um, now, of course, there is a counter to doing good things for your house, because if you improve the quality of your house, the next time it's revalued, you might move to a more expensive notch. So there's actually a perverse incentive not to improve, um, if you look at it that way. Um, the next one, uh, mortgage providers, when you improve your house, 
um, for climate sustainability purposes. It becomes potentially a more valuable house. It becomes a house with a longer lifespan, and yet mortgage providers don't reflect that at all in the risk pricing, which is the interest rate that they charge you for it, which they properly perhaps might should do. Um, the next one, uh, energy costs, heating our houses. Um, the cleanest form that's readily available is electric heating, but it's actually the most expensive way of heating your house. So isn't that a perverse uh, thing in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the agenda here? Um, heat transmission, which is something that happens over relatively short areas, is the one area of public utility where there's no way leave. In other words, there's no utility doesn't have an automatic right to deliver heat, uh, whereas uh, telephones and electricity and gas have way leave rights. They've got to compensate landowners over whose land they go, but they have a right to go over them. There isn't anything for heat. Uh, for, for heat. Um, we've seen a huge move from diesel cars to pet petrol, but actually diesel cars are about 50% more efficient about extracting energy from their fuel, albeit they have in particular particulate contaminations that of the other side of the equation. But nonetheless, on this narrow agenda, it's perverse to move back from diesel to petrol. And finally, just as a good example of, I think, behavior change that might pick up on some things John Ferguson has said about plastics, I, like others, I've got a plastic bag in my hip pocket alongside my wallet now. Um, now, it's not an economic thing, because, I mean, 10 pence for an MSP salary is neither here nor there, to be blunt about it. But it's changed, it has genuinely changed behavior, that really quite tiny thing. What opportunities are we missing? Should we be more rigorous in... The plastic bag is not a tax, of course, but that's just a legislative quirk. Can we do something about the use of plastics in packaging in retail that would have the same effect? How do we get buy-in? You know, because it's probably policymakers and government who are okay. not doing enough. Let's move on to our panel to get a response to that. Susie Good, sir. Um, okay, so that's quite wide ranging. I'll pick, <laughs> I'll pick up on maybe a, a couple of points there. Um, in terms of behaviour change and what opportunities are there, I think one of the most challenging things around behaviour change is transport. Um, and we've talked about electric vehicles. Um, there's also air travel, which is possibly one of the elephants in the room. Um, there's a big issue there around so social norms and aspirations. Um, so I think that's that's going to be one of the challenges if we're talking about long-term challenging targets. I think air travel is going to become one of the big issues over time. Um, in terms of incentives for home energy changes, I'm not sure the rating system is, is the right way to do it. That was included in legislation 10 years ago. Nothing, no one really picked up on it. Um, I'm not sure about house values and energy efficiency changes. I don't really know how... When we buy and sell houses these days, they all have an EPC. Do people look at them? I'm, I'm not actually sure people understand them, to be honest, when, when buying and selling properties. I think there's a lot of education that could still happen there. Um, I think the key driver for people making energy efficiency changes to their house is about the changes that will happen to their bills in the short term. And I think that's probably the, things, the thing to focus. And I think the key barrier is the capital cost of the measures and the upheaval in the house. And I think that any incentives just need to get people over that hump of, of making the, the, the changes in the short term. Anyone else have any points to make, to make on that specifically? Richard Lyle wanted to come in briefly. As a councillor, I think you'll find that uh, banding of houses don't change unless until you sell it. I've upgraded my house quite a number of times and my banding has not changed in the last 40 years. Questions from Claudia Beamish. Um, I'd like to ask a, a question um, initially to, to Dave um, and then expand it and hope that others um, such as Angus might comment from a finance perspective or others will comment from, uh, from their own um, perspectives. And we're all aware that the Scottish Government um, has undertaken to create, in fact, it is creating a Just Transition uh, Commission. Uh, but as things stand, it's not to be legislated for in the bill. 
And I'd, I'd like your comments and others' comments, please, Dave, on uh, whether, in your view, legislating would um, help this uh, commission to carry out its functions better, whether um, independence from government would help, for instance, as well, and if you could comment also on the reporting mechanisms and uh, any other aspects that you think are significant to help affected communities and workers. Yeah, I mean, maybe just, just very briefly, um, uh, just to explain the kind of thinking, I know obviously it's a, the Just Transition Commission um, is a, a Scottish Government initiative. We strongly support it. We believe it's got reasonable um, uh, support, um, uh, uh, we hope, across the, across the chamber. Um, the purpose kind of really reflects, um, in our view, the purpose really reflects um, some of the evidence I've given already. It's about how the various ways, but we think this is a key way um, in which we um, uh, fill or bridge that gap um, between uh, target, between um, idea um, and between delivery, how it engages with um, uh, um, certainly key institutions, that, um, uh, the investment bank, which I've mentioned, but also um, with local authorities, with enterprise agencies, um, to ensure that Really, we would say forever, and we know that the, the Scottish Government's initial proposal, I think, is for a two-year, I'm not giving any secrets away here, um, a, a two-year um, commission, but really which sees that as the companion piece to achieving our targets right through the, the progress of our targets. And that doesn't mean to say that it should be an unchanging or static body, but it does mean that that should be the initial commitment because it really embeds in our view um, the, uh, the principle that every step that we take um, needs, um, and as we look forward to every step that we take, we also need to be looking forward to the economic impacts, to the buy-in, um, and, and, uh, and to social um, justice. Um, we say it should be, it should have a, a fair degree of independence and autonomy, not from the Scottish Government, not as a matter of mistrust, but of experiences of commissions where they have um, independent or semi-independent secretariats, um, uh, where they're able to take advice from across um, um, from across a wide range, um, have um, uh, performed uh, effectively. Um, so, in legislation, because it really is a statement of future intent. Um, uh, um, suitably independent because we think that operates, um, that will make it operate more effectively. Um, uh, requiring, or at least as far as any commission, can require input and report from all of the key institutions, whether that's the, um, the new infrastructure committee, whether that's um, the National Investment Bank and the rest of it, so that we really centralise that idea of um, uh, decent jobs, community justice and just transition, uh, sorry, and, and, um, and proper climate change um, uh, uh, action uh, as something that, that, that is burned into people's minds, whether that's legislators or eventually the consumers that we're hoping will change their behaviour. We just hear um, Angus um, as well and, and others mm. if they want to make any comment on it. Yes, I was going to, just on the oil and gas transition, um, of course, um, electric vehicles are, are coming um, in the car sector and electric buses are also coming very rapidly, perhaps more rapidly uh, worldwide. Um, but that's only a part of oil demand. Um, so the car side is only about 20% of, of world um, oil demand. And even on our very aggressive forecast for um, electric vehicle uptake, um, uh, we, we see only about 7 million barrels of oil per day being taken out as a result of uh, EVs and um, e-buses by 2040. So I think the oil sector is not going to die off very quickly. And the same is true of gas. The gas is still going to be an important uh, fuel in the, in the UK and elsewhere uh, for balancing the system. There's going to be a change in the in the way it's used, less for base load and more for pico gas, but it's going to con continue to imp be important. So I think the scenario for um, oil and gas jobs in the Aberdeen area is probably um, maybe not as immediate as, as some people suggest. Um, there are obviously uh, issues for uh, a kind of slow dwindling of that activity, but um, 
uh, it's had huge swings before with oil prices as, as low as $10 and as high as 140 So I don't think the issue is um, maybe quite as uh, immediate and extreme as, as we might think. Can I, can I just ask you then, um, uh, with a specific question about a just transition commission, or, or beyond that, a just transition, in terms of finance, um, can you give any um, suggestions or recommendations about how finance for the future um, can be equitable in the terms of um, uh, supporting workers? And can there be any criteria for investment or that, um, any expectations set? I mean, I know Mark Carney's highlighted climate change as being a, a very serious imperative. You know, how, how, how does this connect between companies and finance and R&D and, and have you got any comments on that? That's not really my area. I think other, other witnesses might have a better idea. Anyone else? I think you have an investment community in Edinburgh with a company, for example, Bailey Gifford, who's one of the largest fund holders in the world, who have departments that look at the ethical frameworks of the, of the investments and they have global concordats about what is ethical investment. So within that community, um, I think there are standards growing to ensure that those investments are secure. But there's a whole area of global investments that are not subject to those standards. So I think if you ask the experts within the global financial community that are concerned about equitable investment, that they're investing in the right things and not in the wrong things, then you'll find some very good indicators of what is good investment and what isn't. But the global financial community is much wider and perhaps less well-intentioned sometimes. I'm very conscious that we don't have much time left, and my apologies to members that want to come in. Questions from Richard Lyle, and if we have any time at the end, we can maybe pick up on some of the other. I think there's also a comment. There's been various comments, and I haven't been able to uh, basically, had, you know, no time to go through. But I come from an area that had previously had mining, and previously had Lanarkshire had steel. Uh, it was hard, but we basically have recovered to, to a good time, and I'm. I wish Aberdeen Shire well in Aberdeen. You know, at the end of the day, oil is... They keep saying there's no oil left, but then they come out the next day and tell us, we've just found a new field. So, you know, we have to prepare and we have to ensure that people who are in excellent, good jobs up there continue and, and are supported, and I, I, I wish them well. Anyway, can I ask you, as a last question... Has any of the panel carried out an economic assessment of the costs and benefits of mitigating and adapting to climate change? Because we all have to adapt to climate change. The short answer is no, and it would be a, a, a quite enormous undertaking to do. And I kind of, I think I'm going to have to go back to my previous answer and say that that would be. In our view, that would be a primary function of uh, a Just Transition Commission because you cannot look at this without looking at the employment impacts. And I, I, I realise it was a question, not a comment, with respect to the area that you represented um, and Cole, um, but that wasn't the universal um, experience of, um, uh, of people in the, uh, in, in, in the coal industry. We actually see some quite nice examples at the moment in Canada and in Spain where people are doing just transition from coal um, in a far more positive way that I'd, I'd be happy to, um, to, to link the committee to if people, uh, if people were interested. You've asked an enormous question. I, I would be surprised if any single panellist was able to answer that they had, but I think they might be able to suggest ways Comments. in which we might, ways in which we might um, approach that in the period get, ahead. Yeah, we get comments of £13 billion. You know, where, where does that come from? Any, any, does anyone have a, an idea? I've seen various figures using various methodologies, but I think... Um, uh, I think digging into that and doing it in a systematic um, way um, is a big job um, uh, that I'm not qualified to do, but I'm very happy to... to John Ferguson wanted to come it. in to answer the, the main question there. I, mean, I don't know if it was an economic impact assessment with the bill, because you have to do that, obviously, with bills. But I, I will say this, under regulation, environmental regulation, businesses like ours uh, have to report their carbon performance. They therefore look very carefully at um, the auditing process of that, and the cost-benefit analysis of saying, for example, we're going to stop using generated power, which is costing us a lot of money, 
and having a serious impact on the environment through carbon and make a transition to wind power, which will make us so we do very detailed uh, cost benefit analysis at a company level. And that's driven by, by, by regulation. So if you can extend that requirement to do that and aggregate the answers, you're going to get a, a good idea of what that, those savings are, because it's a very important question. One minute left if anyone wants to, to come in. And Mark, Mark Ruskell. Bina, can I just ask um, Dave Moxon just very briefly about the relationship between Just Transition Commission and the UK Climate Change Committee, which is obviously a statutory advisor. Somebody has to help government make a decision about whether a pathway is technically feasible, socially feasible, economically feasible. What, what do you see as the role of Just Transition Commission in working with the UKCC on that question? Um, 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 it's a helpful question because we would see it as a very important um, relationship, not least because all of the things that a Just Transition Commission needs to consider does not um, are, are not limited to powers that rest um, within this place and creating the kind of investment environment um, that we need to achieve some of these things. Also because there's a number of issues in, in terms of what we would describe as the kind of quality of employment because we're looking to guarantee quality of employment here. I hope that, I, know, I know I haven't got very long here, but one of the problems just now for Just Transition going back to Aberdeen is that it's hard to capture the value in a place like Aberdeen of um, all of the opportunities because the way that employment is regulates actually discriminates against local labor and, and in favor of, of different models of employment. So for a whole range of reasons, because powers are held in a different place, um, and um, it is absolutely vital that the Just Transition Commission has a strong relationship, although obviously it wouldn't be statutory with the, uh, with the CCC. Right, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, to, to all our panellists, both remote and in the room. Um, it's been hugely interesting. I'm sorry we didn't have more time. It's very difficult on a Thursday, obviously. Things happen earlier on a Thursday. We had to close early. So thank you very much. At our next meeting on the 20th of November, the committee will continue its consideration of the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill. And the committee will now move into private session. And I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of this meeting is now closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>